Hello, everyone. Uh, happy Saturday. Thanks for taking time to come join us at, at Bad Camp and uh, talk and listen uh, about some, some matters that are important to us and, and I hope important to you too. Uh, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, inclusivity um, but, and about how to you know, kind of think beyond uh, standards and, um, and, uh, and achieve outcomes and, 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 mean, and focus on meaning. Um, so let me give you a little sense of what we're, we're going to talk about here, if my slides will advance. There we go. Um, we'll do a little uh, definition, make sure we're understanding the problem we're, we're trying to solve. We'll introduce ourselves. We'll uh, jump straight into a demo. Um, we won't, won't wait till the end of the presentation to, to bait you into the great reveal, because I think it's important to really um, focus on uh, the you know, substance and and, and look at um, some real world scenarios. So um, after that, we'll have, I think, some interesting takeaways um, and uh, reflections. We'll do a little bit of a fireside chat and explore some of these topical areas um, that are outlined here in the agenda, looking at compliance, how that compares to usability. We'll talk about inclusive design practices, how we can incorporate some strategies uh, into our, our approaches and, and ultimately how we can transform organizations to em embrace uh, inclusion and build that into their their culture. Last, we'll leave you with some resources uh, that you can download and, and access uh, to uh, continue some, some learnings or have access to tools. And we'll have a, a Q&A at the end. Uh, please uh, continue to use the chat. Uh, if you do have a question, if you don't mind putting a, a Q before your questions. So as we scroll back through chats, we can isolate the questions from the conversation. That would be uh, very helpful. There are um, just also some wayfinding here in the hop-in tool. Uh, it kind of gives equal play to all of the presenters. So uh, if you double click on any of the windows, you can see um, aspects of the presentation larger. There's a, a little video demo we'll be playing later. So you might want to think uh, ahead to click on that and make it larger once we, we get to that point. Thank you so much for being here. All right, so what are we here to talk about? Um, well, we're here to talk about uh, inclusion, right? We're here to talk about accessibility, but really uh, at the core of it um, is, in, is in inclusion in our view. But, but what, what is that? What What is inclusion? Um, oh, Andrew, I'm glad you asked because I prepared in a little in advance and uh, pulled up this definition um, I found on the on the interwebs from globaldiversitypractice.com. I thought it summed things up pretty nicely. Uh, inclusion is an organizational effort and practices in which different groups or individuals having different backgrounds are culturally and socially accepted and welcomed and equally treated. And I think we want to really focus Because what this means essentially is that everyone, regardless of race, religion, age, orientation, or ability is treated respectfully and equitably. And equity is really the key here. First, we have to recognize that not everyone is equal in terms of their abilities. And then we can take steps to ensure that everyone is accommodated appropriately so that they can just contribute and participate and accomplish their goals to the best of their abilities and feel like they matter as much as everyone else. So an example in the physical world might be having a wheelchair ramp at the entrance to a building that is, you know, to get up some steps or an auditory indicator at a crossing. Um, so like, so there's a signal that the light has turned green for those who may not be able to see the, the traffic lights. So being inclusive means thinking about how we can accommodate everyone and giving that the attention and energy required to ensure that people are treated equitably so that they feel included in society. Very well said. Um, more specifically, you know, we we work online. We uh, have these notions of of digital inclusion. Um, can we get a little more uh, precise around what this means, William? Like, can you can you help us think through what what digital inclusion means? Sure. So a, a buzzword that goes around is, is accessibility a lot. And as Crispin mentioned, you know, we're talking about equality and and being equitable. Um, for people regardless of their ability and the other differences that, that make us all unique. Um, so the world is increasingly digital 
uh, commerce is done online. Uh, conferences are done online. We, we, you know, we're all aware of, of what impact that has, but if you take that away from someone and, and, not, and prevent them from being able to participate in, in digital spaces like we're doing now, then that's the opposite of inclusion. That's, that's being exclusive, right? So accessibility is, is going to be a theme that we talk about. It's something we need to be talking about. It's important and it's the important first step, but it's not the end goal for us. Um, Usability is is a nice little add-on on top of that. Accessibility being the minimum, uh, you know, the uh, achievement, and then usability being kind of on top of the fact that I can technically access something. How usable is it for me when I'm accessing it? And then digital inclusion, which is our ultimate goal, is taking into consideration everyone that's using the product. Do we have not the same experience for everyone else, but an equitable experience with regards to efficiency and enjoyment of the platform that, that's being used? Thanks for that distinction. Um, very important to wrap our heads around the problem. Well, um, just take a minute to uh, introduce our, ourselves to the, the audience so they can understand uh, where where we're coming from, what our particular vantage points are. Um, if you don't mind uh, uh, introducing yourselves and um, uh, you know your where you are, what you're from, uh, where you're from, and um, and perhaps a little word about how you first got interested about um, accessibility. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, uh, my name is Andrew Malice. I am uh, CEO of Calamuna, uh, an agency that is uh, based in Oakland and Toronto. And we do um, a lot of work with nonprofits and mission-driven organizations. Uh, I got really interested in accessibility. Um, many years ago, I went to an accessibility-focused conference just out of curiosity. It was at the University of Toronto. Uh, they gave us a tour of a, a lab, which, which was uh, the base of, of Robart's library, which is the, it was just incredible. They had all of the assistive technologies um, that were present, and, and they, sh they showed us how to, to test websites for all these amazing, with all these amazing devices. And it just really opened my mind to, to so many possibilities and opportunities, and, and it's really just been, uh, you know, for the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, fascinated uh, with the topic. William. Hi, my name is William Russell. I'm the director of uh, client services and technical development with the American Foundation for the Blind. And I've been in this space for my entire career. About 12 years ago, I applied for an internship uh, at a place called AFB Tech in college. And at the time, I hadn't I didn't know anything about accessibility, didn't know about assistive technology or anything like that. And so when I interviewed with a guy who was blind and he told me that he he really liked the writing sample I'd sent in. I sent in a Word document, and but he he said that I misspelled a word, and I checked later, and I, I hadn't actually misspelled a word. I used like one of those neighbor words where it didn't show up on spell check. It was very similarly spelled. It was an incorrect word, um, but he found that, and I didn't, and I had to figure out how he could do that. Um, so that that was a really just fascinating intro into the world of how people interact with technology in ways that I didn't expect. And I've been uh, working with AFB ever since in the technology lab, evaluating technology, um, moving towards some research-based uh, projects, and then mo more recently moving into consulting, working with clients and uh, trying to make their products more accessible, uh, usable, and inclusive for people with disabilities. Thanks so much, Crispin. Hi, my name is Crispin Bailey, and I'm the Director of Design and User Experience at Calamuna. I'm based in, up near Toronto, Canada. I'm responsible for Calamuna's design and strategy practice, which includes managing our design and content strategy team and supporting the team on discovery uh, and design phases for our client projects. I've been passionate about web accessibility for nearly 20 years, starting with my introduction to the topic, which happened uh, a long time ago when I read a book called Building Accessible a person named Joe Clark in 2002. And shortly after that, I read a book called Designing with Web Standards by Jeffrey Zeldman. And that came out in, I think, 2003. And this was a really pivotal time in web design um, because as web designers, we were finally able to stop building websites with tables and transparent spacer GIFs, and we could use CSS to style and lay out our pages. And that was really eye-opening, but it was really fundamentally eye-opening to me to understand that 
as it was just as important, and in the case of accessibility, even more important, uh, how a web page was built and structured than it was how it looked. And that's been uh, something I've carried with me throughout the rest of my, my entire web design career since that time, spoken on the topic at camps and uh, champion the cause wherever I can in our own agency and out and about. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'd, I'd like to pass it over to William and give us a little demo of, um, you know, what, well, why don't you introduce it, William? We do it sure. so well. So this is just a quick demo of a couple of things that uh, you can find when you go to a website and turn on a screen reader. And if you've never seen this before, uh, it can be pretty interesting. And there's also a bit at the end, pair kind of the way that automated test tools uh, can identify issues and the difference between what an automated test tool finds and what a manual tester will find. Um, so I, I, think it's, I think it speaks for itself and, and it'll set up some interesting conversations kind of harkening back to that you know, minimum standard of, of accessibility moving towards really understanding what users are experiencing. So I will go ahead and click play on this video. And just as a reminder, I think you can double click uh, the video for uh, Vaccine Finder and that should maximize it. So. Uh, and Andrew, give me a thumbs up if this sounds OK. I'm at vaccinefinder.org, and I'm going to step through this interface in a couple of different ways. So first, we'll just go through with the keyboard and mouse, and we'll see that we've got a form here for selecting a vaccine. And if I click on Select a Vaccine, it opens up a modal. And the modal has some filter radio buttons across the top for ages and a long list of checkboxes for the types of vaccines I might be interested in. So I'll go ahead and select some of those, click Add for Vaccines, and we'll see that we're back at the original form. We've got a location field that we fill in. So I'm going to type in Florida for that and go ahead and select that and a search area for the number of miles away from the location I selected. We'll click Search for a Vaccine. And on the left, we've got a list of results. On the right, we've got a map with pins on it, as we would see pretty typically. And if I select one of these stores from the list here, I'm going to be taken into a details page with things like the location, the contact information, the hours. So very simple. It took me about you know, 30 seconds to do it with a mouse primarily. And now let's try doing the same thing with just a keyboard, which is something you should be able to do with any website. So we'll go ahead and try the same thing and we'll tab. We will use space arrow up and down. You know, pretty simple controls for activating and interacting with a page with a keyboard. So at the top of this form, we can see that there's a faint focus indicator for vaccines. And if I keep tabbing through the interface, it works as expected until all of a sudden after the near this location field, we have nothing. And if I tab again, I don't know where my focus has gone. Tab again. And then finally, it shows up at the end of the map. So there seems to be some non-focusable elements in here, but I don't really know because my focus was gone. So we'll go ahead and open select your vaccines and open that modal. I can tab through the radio buttons pretty well uh, for selecting an age. And then once I get into this list of checkboxes, my focus disappears again. And I'm just going to hit space. And it, OK, so focus was in this list, but I didn't know where it was. So if I just keep tabbing through and pressing space, I can play guess and check with this to select my vaccines, but that's not advisable. So we'll go ahead and power through it with add four vaccines. It takes us back to the original form. Now we need to add our location with this location field. So I'm just going to start typing Florida and then tab a couple of times here. And then it just closed. So I did not press anything. I didn't press space or enter to confirm the location that I wanted from this autocomplete list, but it closed anyway. So I'll try that again, because I really want to get to that fourth element there. And I tabbed through it. And this time, it was kind and let me do it. So it's pretty unexpected. It seems to be based on the timing that I use. That time, it, it collapsed again. So OK, that's not great, but we'll keep moving. The problem here with this search area combo box or drop down select control thing. And uh, I can make an assumption that my focus is on it and I will try it. And then I was correct. I've got the list of options here and I would expect to be able to arrow up and down through these and change the option. And that doesn't seem to be happening as I arrow up and down here, uh, but I'll go ahead and press space and see what happens. 
selected 50 miles. Great. Okay, so again, I can make some guesses here as to what's going on. It might be difficult to select exactly what I want, but at least I can make this thing work if I play around with it some. But I can't really do it accurately. So we'll go ahead and search for vaccine. And on the left side, we're going to get a list of the results as we saw before. On the right side, we're going to get this map. So we will tab through the interface again. We're at the top of the page. And then I want to go into this list here. So I'm going to tab. Uh-oh, my focus has disappeared. Tab. Yeah, now we're at the end of the map. So it looks like this entire list has been skipped and it's not in the focus order. So if I actually wanted to click on one of these results, one of these providers, to get hours or other kind of information like we saw on the details page, I can't do that with a keyboard. So it's a pretty ex a simple example. It's not hard to test for keyboard accessibility like this, and it's really important to make sure that all the controls are functional because the next use case I have is a screen reader user. And if you've never heard or used a screen reader before, it might be a little bit overwhelming, a little bit verbose, but the mechanisms are essentially the same. I'm just navigating the web page with a keyboard, but the screen reader is going to tell me things as I land on them. So each element needs to have useful information about it. So we'll go ahead and turn that on. I'm going to use non-visual desktop access, which is a Windows screen reader. It's free and open source, and there are uh, built-in screen readers for all of the main operating systems. So that tone lets me know that NVDA is now running. And now I'm on the page, and NVDA is going to try to start talking. So as I tab through it, it's going to read, and we can hear things that it's Banner saying. Banner landmark list. Clickable find vaccine visited link. Clickable list find vaccine. Clickable FAQ link clickable FAQ link. So that's pretty expected. It's going to tell me what the name of it is, what the role is, and the value that's selected. Select your vaccines button. So we'll go in here. We see that select your vaccines button uh, is labeled effectively. And then I'll button. tab again. And I just have this element that just says button. So that's not great because I don't know what that button means. Let's go ahead and open the vaccine modal here. Cancel button. All ages button. Zero three mos button. YRS. So as I tab through the interface here, uh, it seems to, to make pretty good sense. And I will go ahead and go into the list of checkboxes. 960 DT checkbox not checked. D top E checkbox not checked. Hepatitis A, 18 plus. Checkbox not checked. Space. Checked. So I can tab through these. I get the label and it tells me if it's checked or not checked. So everything is working pretty well actually better with a screen reader running than if I was just using the keyboard alone, because at least I know what these checkboxes are. So I'll select space. a few of them. Hepat space. Checked. Add three vaccines button. And then I'll go ahead and go down to the button and add three vaccines. Space. Oh. Hepatitis A. 18. So it takes me back to the original form Click here. Button. So I'll tap to the interface. Banner and then, uh, button. Oh, no. Button. Button. I hear a button. button button, button. I have no idea what these things are. Button. And even worse, it's different from what I saw before. The screen reader experience is pretty similar to the keyboard experience throughout this entire interface. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what an automated scan is going to tell us. Went ahead and refreshed the page. I'm going to open up the select vaccines modal again so that we have something interesting to scan. And if you remember, we had all of the problems with finding those checkboxes and then we should also have everything behind this element as well open. So let's go to the Axe tool. And to be clear, I think the Axe accessibility checker is great because it finds real problems and problems that should be fixed and doesn't have a lot of or any false positives. But we'll see what it actually tells us about this experience, which I hope I've demonstrated is not optimal. So we have 54 issues. 49 of the issues are related directly to elements must have sufficient color contrast, which possibly is true. But looking through this and doing some of the some testing beforehand, what we actually saw and experienced does, does not have any significant color contrast problems. So the accessibility checker struggles with that if it's complex CSS or if there's background images or hidden elements that just need to be cleaned up. So it's worth checking into, but I don't think that it impacted our actual experience any. We have aria hidden equals true must not be present on the document body. Documents must have one main landmark. Zooming and scaling must not be disabled. Page must contain one level one heading. And aria element must not contain focusable elements. 
All of those are true and good suggestions that should be fixed on the page, but none of them had anything to do with unlabeled buttons, had anything to do with the keyboard control not working on that autocomplete field and the weirdness that we experience with the search area drop down as well. So the types of issues that this automated checker are finding are not issues that as a user just now, I actually experienced any impact at all trying to accomplish selecting a vaccine and moving through the process to find details about a pharmacy. So there we have it. Um, if you've never seen that before, it's probably a ton of information to get uh, to, to parse all at once. Um, but I think that we can you know, go into a little bit of detail about what it means uh, when we're talking about finding these issues. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick it back over to you, Andrew. Thanks. Well, I mean, let's just take a minute to think about what, what just happened here. Um, you know, what are the, what's the impact on, on the user, right? Um, we essentially had pretty decent accessibility from a compliance standpoint, a few suggestions, as you pointed out. Um, but the net outcome was the user couldn't really achieve the goals the organization wanted them to, and that they were there to, um, uh, to try and achieve, right? So um, really interesting to think about that. All right, let's, um, let's get into it a little bit. Uh, let's talk about um, this matter of compliance, you know, versus usability, as, as the demonstration has, um, has suggested. Um, what, what's important to think about here, um, William, like when, um, organizations are, are approaching, um, approaching making their sites accessible, usable, um, how, how does this change in, in focus that we're advocating for, um, affect, um, affect their, how can it affect their, their, how should they be thinking about uh, these questions of usability versus compliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, the first thing I want to say is that you know the the automated testing and the automated scanning, none of them complain uh, or none of them purport to find all of the conformance issues that are out there. Um, and that's at least good that they're they're honest. And and automated testing can be an, an effective tool that can be implemented into a uh, a development workflow, but it it's not necessarily like like we said. Um, telling us what users are actually experiencing. And so we have this set of conformance issues that, that people, uh, that sites will have. And we have a set of usability problems that, that, and, and goals that users have. And I think we actually have a, have a slide here um, that, that kind of shows the, the two and the, the, interlap, uh, the overlap between the two. So what we're what we're suggesting is that an accessibility conformance issue, a WCAG com compliance issue, or whatever, should should be resolved. That should be a goal. But in a world of limited resources and limited timescales, um, there is we would prefer that more effort be placed on understanding what the user experience actually is, uh, and using that as a priority or to prioritize the way that uh, issues are fixed. So you know we'll we'll go into a lot of details about what we think an ideal process would look like as far as integrating this, um, integrating inclusion into design and development and, and policies and all of that. But I think the, the important takeaway to start considering is let's figure out what matters most. Let's take an agile approach to like we take with everything else in finding and identifying problems that really matter. And that, that then can alleviate some of the barriers to even attempting to start that people have. Like, for example, um, when you receive an automated scan that says you have 150,000 problems on your site, that you might as well have a billion problems on your site. Where do you start with that, right? There's no way for you to approach that in any meaningful way to start it resolving those problems. But if we look at how people are actually using our site. What do we want people to be ac accomplishing? What are those user goals? And then start testing those. Then we'll find a much smaller 
set of problems to be resolved. And then as we move forward and mature, we can look at the rest of those conformance issues as well. Let's, let's dig into that a little more. Um, think about how, how we can apply this thinking you know, at the earliest stages of, um, of our processes. We've talked a little bit about you know, remediation, about conformance, about usability, and about fixing things. Um, but there are opportunities um, to avoid some of these problems you know, in the first place. And um, uh, let's, um, let's investigate that a little bit. Um, Crispin, can you, can you walk us through some opportunities in, um, in the type of work that we do building, building websites, building platforms? Um, and, and where where we can apply our our thinking. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, you know, as William was alluding to, it's really important that the you know the philosophical approach is not just about checking off the boxes and, and meeting some compliance guidelines. So that I just wanted to call that out because ultimately there are a lot of ways people can achieve that compliance, um, and some of them are terrible from a user uh, from a ease of use standpoint standpoint uh, there's even just recently very topical this week i heard about a case being brought against uh, a company that's used an overlay uh, for to provide accessibility to their website but it doesn't provide an equal experience uh, for those users with assistive technology so what we advocate for is thinking about and and that's really those overlays that are being basically tacked on top of a website that has problems is supposed to be you know, a shortcut to fix a problem that never should have been there in the first place. And it wouldn't have been there in the first place if they had designed from the ground up with accessibility and inclusivity in their design and development process. So you know, this, this um, diagram that we're, we're sharing here is uh, you know very broad life cycle kind of illustration, but it, we, what we want to do is incorporate the accessibility considerations uh, at the very beginning of the project. And of course, this is going to work best for new projects like a site redesign. It's always easier to start from the ground up and, and start from scratch in that respect. Um, but some of the still some of the issues still apply even if you're just trying to make tweaks to an existing site. So like I said, ideally, even before you start um, getting into a redesign project, even before like an RFP goes out, um, it should be top of mind. But at this point, it's a good idea at the beginning of the project to define what the requirements are. Um, and it's also really important that everyone on the team, whether they're content producers or designers or developers, all have a basic knowledge of, of accessibility and some of the concerns. Uh, because a lot of this stuff is really easy if you just do it right and if you know what you're doing. So during discovery, we define our user types and their goals, and this sets the stage for the entire project. And it's really critical to incorporate user goals that identify accessibility concerns. For example, we might have a user type or types that represent people with disabilities. And this gets both the design and the dev team and the client on the same page about ensuring adequate accommodations um, that will be considered later in the project. And sometimes the client already has a mandate, but if they don't, this is an opportunity to educate them on the importance of ensuring that their site is accessible and reassuring them that it doesn't mean that they can't still have a beautiful, highly engaging and interactive website. During the design phase, which often includes content production, um, this is when we begin to incorporate some of those considerations that we've previously defined. So for example, the content needs to be structured semantically while it's still in Word or gather content or Google Docs, right? Like specify what the H1 is, what the H2s are, and the H3s, make sure that they're nested properly. And then when we're wireframing, you know, let's take into account things like menu structure and wayfinding and any important elements with interactivity. And then obviously once we get into the visual design, we want to look at color contrast, UI elements like inline links and how those are treated active states or focus states like William was showing us in, in the walkthrough. Um, and then things like, you know, where do we want to apply progressive enhancement for animations or transitions, to, but still make sure that fundamentally underneath we have a, a usable website by anybody with any technology. And then, you know, we might prototype components. That's another opportunity to test our designs. Again, doing this all along the way is just so much easier. We can just catch these things and, and, and fix them quickly. So whether it's a low fidelity clickable wireframe or a fully responsive HTML or CSS prototype, we can test with users to flag any potential issues before building them into the CMS like Drupal. Now, 
While we can address most concerns without any additional cost or impact on the project timeline or budget, that's not to say there won't be challenges. And during implementation, sometimes we need to include third-party widgets or plugins or some modules that we didn't, we didn't write, and those may not be accessible. So then it becomes a conversation, of course, uh, with the client uh, potentially or, or with your boss about you know, potential options. And you know, hopefully there's another tool that can be used to accomplish the same goal. Uh, but sometimes we may want to contact the maintainer about, uh, about the issue um, and hopefully they'll fix it. Uh, or maybe we'll have to build something from scratch, or maybe we can fix that module ourselves and contribute that fix back to the community. So, you know, the, the message here is, you know, if you're thinking about these concerns from the beginning and all the way through the project, it doesn't have to be an, a big extra lift or a big extra cost. And hopefully you haven't left it till the end of the project because that's when it's gonna be a lot more work. And that means more time and more money um, to fix any issues. Thanks so much, Crispin. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about how um, how we can define a strategic approach um, to to solving these um, uh, to solving this problem to to um, uh, uh, addressing user testing in particular. You know how. How do we? Where do we start? Like, how does how does this take shape? Um, William, can you give us a little bit of insight into into how um, one goes about, you know, incorporating this kind of user testing uh, in, into a practice? Demystify it a little bit for us. I think the demo was useful, um, but if you could help build some bridges to the for the audience, that would be that would be very appreciated. Yeah, sure. So. The key is to just start doing it, I think. Um, there is nothing particularly um, difficult about using assistive technology. It is uh, accessible on all the different platforms that we're developing on. Um, so I think it is a responsibility that we all have to understand how people are using um, technology, at least at a baseline level. We, we can never, um, as a sighted person myself, I can never say how a user experience is going to be. I have a team and I have colleagues who have uh, who are authentic user testers uh, with with disabilities who perform the testing as part of our practice. And that is, I think, the ideal situation to be able to actually find people in the community that are using your products to, to be able to find that um, that feedback. But the key is to start. Um, there's there's a lot you can do just by not touching your mouse and trying to you know sign up for your website or something like that. So just use the keyboard and attempt to fill out a form. And that will show you a lot of deficiencies, or maybe not, maybe you've got a perfect website, um, but that will uncover a lot of problems that, that people may be encountering just because you try to use it in a slightly different way than was expected. Um, you can also try you know, browser zoom in, on on your web page, make sure that when you zoom in using uh, using the the browser tools that your content reflows. You know, responsive design is an expectation now, um, but is it responsive up to 200, 300 percent magnification, which is what somebody with low vision would be using? Um, there's also, uh, like Crispin was mentioning, design considerations regarding you know contrast and those sorts of uh, those things that, that can be done. And there are lots of checklists, lots of resources. We'll provide one at the end uh, of this presentation where you can learn more about the ways that that can be done. So I think you know, turning on a screen or downloading NVDA as a developer or a designer, um, it doesn't take long for you to really get an understanding of, of why you're doing what you're doing. And I think that really is, uh, that's, that's really important to, to start. Um, ideally, we're able to start building empathy um, as, as designers and developers, um, and then uh, solving most of those problems that, that, that don't need to be solved by an expert, right? There are certainly uh, agencies, AFB is one of them, that, that can provide that detailed uh, um, evaluation conformance and, and that expert level knowledge that maybe your organization doesn't have. But that's not where we need to start because it's not a switch we can flip. It's a journey that we're all uh, going to be starting to become more inclusive. And uh, it, it can start just with some simple testing. 
um, and there are there are resources that we can provide to get started doing that. Uh, two two quick follow-ups here for you, William. Um, uh, one, uh, you mentioned uh, NVDA, um, it, mm -hmm. which is is great if if you're on Windows. Uh, mm -hmm. If people aren't on Windows, you know, do you have another suggestion for them uh, as to where to start? And then um, as well, like why why do we start with a, a screen reader? You know, there's so many other assistive technologies out there. Mm -hmm. Should we be testing for all of these other technologies from eye gaze to other things? Can mm -hmm. you speak to, to that and, 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 and uh, why it's strategically important to, yep. to focus on these tools? Yep. So if you're on a, on a Mac, you can press Command F5 and VoiceOver will start talking. And you can press Command F5 again to make it stop talking, which is usually the follow-up to that statement, um, because otherwise you can get frustrated not understanding what it is. But VoiceOver uh, on the Mac is, is great. And on iOS, uh, the VoiceOver is in the accessibility menu. Um, you can set up a uh, accessibility shortcut. So you tri triple tap the home button and VoiceOver will start speaking. So you can toggle it on and off. Um, similarly, in Android, there's a, a screen reader called TalkBack. Um, and there are lots of other options on Windows as well, JAWS. Um, Narrator is built in. So there are lots of different screen readers that are freely available and at no cost and built into the platforms that we're, we're using. So the reason why we start, I, I would say we start with a keyboard. And then we move to the screen reader case. Keyboard is something that you probably have in front of you right now, and you can just start doing that without doing anything. Um, but the reason why the, key, the, the screen reader use case is the more complex one is because all of the content on the page has to be structured. Crispin was, was talking about semantics and, and the metadata that is part of the HTML spec. Um, sim similarly, everything I'm saying about the web is also applicable to native iOS and Android. It's just slightly different APIs. Um, but that, that semantic structure and the requirement for having well-defined uh, and alternative text for images and things like that for someone who can't see the screen is the most complex use case. And so if you cover that, and you've, you've already covered the keyboard use case. And then if you've covered the keyboard use case, you've covered the switch access use case, where somebody who has a mobility dis, uh, mobility impairment might be using switches instead of a, a keyboard, a typical keyboard. Um, similarly with eye tracking, that's an emulation on of, for a mouse. So it's great to be able to test with all of these things, but the way that APIs and the, the HTML spec and uh, the operating systems and platforms are made to work is that it doesn't really matter what people are using. Um, but the screen reader use case is one that is going to cover most of the uh, most of the different um, scenarios uh, that you may be able to avoid uh, doing if you're not testing with the screen reader, for example. But the point is, the APIs, when well, uh, when conformed to properly, and uh, you're using all of the HTML and the ARIA spec correctly, any assistive technology you plug into it, whether it's a braille display or any of the other types of assistive technology should just work. And that's the point of having assistive technology. It adapts to the user. It doesn't adapt to your interface. Thanks so much. Um, well, we're almost out of time. Uh, just um, wanted to come back and reflect on, on, the, on this question of, um, of cultural change. And um, just thinking about, you know, uh, there's a, firstly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm elated that so many organizations are responding to the, um, um, to the, the challenge of making their uh, technologies more accessible and more inclusive. Um, and that's great. You know, as, as agencies, we're seeing more and more uh, requirements, you know, come up for um, uh, accessibility conformance. Sometimes, you know, that can be at the detriment of usability, um, you know, as we've, as we've uh, noted. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, what we've seen be really successful in, in terms of transforming organizations is, is more, more than just saying, you know, hey, we're going to do something about this. We're going to put this requirement in our RFPs. Um, that, that's, it's okay, but it really takes a bit of an institutional shift, a bit of a internal champions to be able to take this mandate and continue to move it forward even beyond, uh, you know, a redesign because uh, accessibility, inclusivity, it, it affects the whole life cycle of, of the product. And, and that's something that an organization needs to assume, you know, 
responsibility for. It goes into drafting accessibility poli policies. It, it goes into um, you know changing that that psychology. You know, there's some there's some kind of like psychology of conformance that that occurs, right? When you're trying to just um, respond and you're being responsive and you're trying to adhere, it, it, it divorces you from the potential to take on uh, leadership, to find the gaps in those standards and help move them forward, to contribute back in open source communities, to make the changes that are going to have an impact on, on user lives. And that, that affects you know, a whole swath of uh, user experience practices and how we design uh, products and how we're building um, themes, you know, for, for Drupal itself. I think it's, it's, it's a really great, uh, great example of how uh, changing our um, perspective can create a much better product instead of trying to tack on, you know, accessibility at the end. Um, so we're coming up on, on time. Um, I'll scan through, see if there's some other uh, questions that uh, we can answer. Happy to uh, stick around a little bit. Before we go, wanted to leave you with some, some resources. Um, we have a little uh, white uh, PDF download that has links to some of the tools that we mentioned here and some other um, kinds of uh, utilities as well as uh, standards and how-tos how and FAQs and, and a good place to sort of get started um, if you're looking for a compendium of resources. It's available at uh, bit.li uh, slash uh, a one one Y, which is uh, dash T I P S dash S. Um, so that's there for you to um, to use. If you'd like to uh, get in touch with us, um, you can reach out to uh, to Kalamuna or the American Foundation for the Blind at afb.org or kalamuna.com. And let's see if we have some time for uh, for questions here. Um, uh, apologies earlier for. Uh, Yes, the, uh, the animation uh, going on a little longer than we had uh, intended, got a little stuck. Um, and I think we've answered uh, Richard's question already about uh, Mac. And we'll paste, uh, paste the bit.ly link into the chat. That's not a problem. I'll do that. Any other thoughts and questions so far? Um, got a little little extra time maybe um, uh, Crispin what, what have you what have you seen as far as um, you know the most uh, kind of dastardly integrations or or things that people want that may that may really impact uh, usability and inclusivity um, in the sort of earlier stages of the project um, the wants the we want this uh, let's do it this way this looks really mm -hmm. cool what do we, uh, and how do we have those conversations uh, around mm. making sure that those solutions are mm. inclusive? Well, yeah, there are a lot of egregious, um, <laughs> uh, I guess, flagrant disregards for accessibility out there, but a lot of times it comes just from a lack of knowledge or understanding. And the worst offender is, of course, the auto-playing background video that can't be paused, uh, and uh, it, even worse if it has audio that hasn't, you know, that can't be turned off. These are uh, very impactful. And the the key is that it's it's not that it's going to affect everyone, but it can tremendously affect some people. And so sensitivities of motion, they can't focus on the content. There's animation uh, happening in the background or on the screen. And apologies for the animation earlier, um, still, uh, because that was a, an example of what we don't want to do is, is have something constantly moving. So like an auto-playing carousel is another example, just rotating through the slides so that all those marketing messages or whatever, those announcements get seen. But we know people don't like that. Um, they're not, it's not going to encourage them to click on things. They're just, just going to scroll to get that out of their faces because it's even for people who don't have motion sensitivities, it's a distraction. So those are some of the things I've seen. And what I'd like to advocate for with our clients when we're having these conversations is if we want to do these things, we can, but we have to put the right mechanisms in place so that they can be accessible so that they can be turned off, stopped, whatever. And I like to, you know, advocate for usability. And that's something that really needs to be emphasized. Accessibility with, with poor usability is not a good solution. 
you need both because just you can make an accessible website by all like like WCAG 2.1 triple A and it can suck as a user experience for anyone or for everyone. So you really need to focus on the usability and the accessibility. Uh, William, how do we um, have you seen um, organizations help transform their development culture in, in particular to better better embrace and um, and apply these these principles for for internal teams? Hmm. Well, if you have the resources, it's great to work with an external partner or develop an internal SME, but that's not something everyone can do. Um, when we're working with with development teams, our goal is with every engagement to provide more than just a list of issues, but to provide the meaning and purpose behind why these issues need to be fixed. And I think that that is probably the most important thing is to build that empathy um, with developers because you can give a list of issues with no context and get those issues fixed once, but that kind of curiosity as to why a problem needs to be fixed is really what's critical to ensure that that, uh, that the culture moves forward in that development or design team. Um, so ensuring that we move with continuous improvement in mind and the knowledge transfer that we don't just fix something once and then forget why we fixed it, that's, that's super critical. So being intentional about absorbing that information is really important. Very good. Very, very good. All right. Well, we're, um, we're at time. Um, really want to thank everyone for, uh, for being here, for, for thinking about these, uh, these matters. Um, posted uh, an updated link to um, the, the tips here in the, in the chats. We'll update our slides as well. Um, sorry, I guess our, our bit.ly link must have gotten overrated. And um, uh, yes, yeah, so there's, um, there's the, the link again, uh, if, you, if you need it. Uh, apologies. Um, and uh, we hope that you'll, um, you know, you'll, you'll head, head forth um, with um, some renewed vigor around, uh, around usability um, as, it, as it pertains to uh, making your, your products more inclusive. And uh, feel free to reach out, um, have, have some, uh, uh, we'd love to chat some more about your, your thoughts and, and your experiences. Um, uh, thank, thanks so much for the work that you do. Uh, these are important, uh, important topics. Um, want to make sure that the web is accessible for all. And um, thank you, thank you all for, for being here. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks so much. William. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone who came.